You have your Bible this morning, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. We've been uh, looking now for a while about growing in grace, and uh, we've looked at lots of passages on grace and how you grow in grace and linking together the spiritual disciplines and grace. We'll do that for another week, and then I'll start a series on what would you do if you weren't afraid. You ever thought about that? On the wall and the headquarters at Facebook, there's a statement, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Because they encourage innovation. They encourage risk-taking. And so we're going to look at the Bible and uh, talk about what would you do if you weren't afraid. We're going to take a lot of different theological uh, concepts and and look at uh, them from that perspective. But today, growing in grace, the grace of service, you could say the grace of ministry, And Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, the end of all things is near. Now, you would suppose if the end of all things is near, why do you want to worry about doing anything else? How long have we lived with those kinds of headlines? The end is near. And when people think the end is near, they just pack it up, fold it up, give up, and quit. And that's what you might think Peter would say here, but he goes in the opposite direction. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. This is one of those great statements in Scripture about love. Love does not dig up sins and bring up sins. And uh, love is the opposite of what our news media is all about. That is finding what's wrong with you and publicizing it. Love covers it over. Love forgives and love moves on offer hospitality to one another without grumbling you want to do something nice for somebody don't do it and then gripe about it okay offer hospitality without to one another without grumbling each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully administering what God's grace in its various forms and so service is, is the grace of service. That's what the Bible's teaching us here. If anyone speaks, he should do it. And, and Peter, by the way, gives a few examples. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever Amen. If anybody serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. Do you ever just flat get tired of serving? I saw a dad this morning with several kids, and I said, hey, how are you doing? He said, about medium. I said, medium, what does medium do? What does medium mean? And he said, well, I felt worse yesterday, and I'll feel even worse tomorrow. And so that's medium. And oftentimes we get that medium feeling, especially when it comes to service. I want to give up. I want to quit. And the older we get, it seems like the more we want to do that. We want to pack it in. And so when Peter writes this passage of Scripture, he's talking to people who think they're coming to the very end. They don't have very many more days. So, hey, why not just eat, drink, and be merry and what? For tomorrow you die. And this seems to be the attitude of some of the people, and Peter's encouraged them to go in the opposite direction. There are a number of really good books dealing with how we grow and how we age, how we either maintain health or we allow health to break down. Lots of good books being written. I've mentioned a few of those in the last few years. One of those entitled The Blue Zone by Dan Bittner, a uh, National Geographic writer, Bittner studied the world and uh, tried to find out where do people live the longest and stay the healthiest. You don't want to just live a long time and be a vegetable, but you want to live a long time and stay healthy all the way to the very end. Where are those areas? He found four areas in the world, and he took a map pencil, blue map pencil, and he circled them. And they're called the blue zone. And in the book, he talks about why those people seem to live to 107, 108, 110. One lady plus 100 had started making herself up and she started dating again. He said, dating again? You're over 100 years of age. 
She said, well, I found a young guy, 78, and uh, I started dating. And so Bittner says, what, what is it about these people? How does that happen? Well, in Lessons for Living Longer from People Who've Lived the Longest in the Blue Zone, Bittner writes, Okinawans call it Igikai, and Nicoyans, Nicoya Cyprus, call it Plan de Vida. But in both cultures, the phrase essentially translates, why I wake up in the morning. So they're talking about living longer and living hell. Why I wake up in the morning, the strong sense of purpose possessed by the older Okinawans, he says, may act as a buffer against stress, help reduce their chances of suffering from Alzheimer's disease, arthritis, and stroke. Dr. Robert Butler and collaborators led an NIH-funded study that looked at the correlation between having a sense of purpose and longevity. His 11-year study followed highly functioning people between the ages of 65 and 92 and found that individuals who expressed a clear goal in life, something to get up for in the morning, something that made a difference, lived longer and were sharper than those who did not. Now, if you're looking forward to the day when you have nothing to do, that's a bad sign. If you're thinking to yourself, I'm just going to be so happy when I have nothing to do, I'll just lay around all morning. I was talking to one of my friends who retired some years ago, and he's a little bit older than I am. And I said, how's it going? He said, pretty good, except my wife's on my back. I said, surprise, about what? He said, I like to just sit around in pajamas till about 10 o'clock in the morning, plant Sudoku. And she's out to get up and get some clothes on. Get out and do something. He said, I'm retired. I don't care, she said. That's not the way we grew up. So he said, I have to get up and get dressed. Get out of the house. Something to look forward to, something to do. Having some purpose in life, having something to do, helping others. That's what Peter's talking about here. The grace of service. The end may be near, but that doesn't mean that people don't need help, and we can help them. When Peter and Silas penned these words, they felt that time was coming. And it seems that that would be the last thing people would be interested in. But Peter lets us know that grace is the activity of the heart of God. Service is God's grace through us to others. The grace of service is a gift. It comes with a new birth. And it is expected of every believer. In fact, that's why God gifted us. That grace of service operates through gifts he gives us, not through something we just think up, not something we've developed on our own, not because we're genetically predisposed to be that way. God actually puts a gift in us when we are born again. Isn't that wonderful? He equips us. He gets us ready, not just to wait till we die and go to heaven, but to actually do something while we're here. As a Christian, to wake up every morning with a purpose, with a purpose. Now, the grace of new birth, uh, the grace of service comes with the new birth. Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, 10, each one of you should use whatever gift you've received. Each one of you, he's addressing believers here. Every believer gifted with the grace of forgiveness for eternal life, but also gifted to serve. In 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9, Peter reminds them of the wonderful gift of eternal life. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's different from any other world religion. No other world religion has any leader who has ever survived death. And so that's why the Christian faith is a living hope and a living Savior. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. You're never going to lose your place as a child of God. You'll always be a child of God. You may be a good child of God. You may be a bad child of God. But you'll always be a child of God. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. That's when all this earth is 
remade at the way God wants it to be. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have, to, may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. We're not delivered from suffering just because we're believers. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you've not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Written by a man who had seen Jesus, who had been with Jesus, who had walked with Jesus, talking to people who had not personally been with the Jesus in the physical realm, but are now with him by faith. For you receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It's wonderful to know that when God forgives us of our sins, we're always forgiven. We stand forgiven because of Jesus Christ. We are saved, we're always saved. We're saved, we're safe in Christ. But beyond that, and this is where we oftentimes fall away, beyond that, we're created in Christ to serve. The grace of salvation becomes the grace of service. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He's gifted us, prepared in advance. Before you ever come to know Christ, he knows what he's going to give you as a gift, and it's going to be a gift to do good works. In 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 12 uh, verses 4 through 11, Paul just lists some of these gifts. They're listed in a number of places, but this is the most extensive list. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord, the same one directing them. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, the manifestation or appearing of the Spirit. If you're an usher here, you, you appear at that door and you usher and you have in your hands uh, orders of service. That is a manifestation of a gift that you have to be a servant. And so the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there's given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. You may be a person who can listen to someone tell you a story, give you an idea of what's going on in their life, and you speak back to them a word of wisdom, which is the right way to respond to that issue. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So when you're born again, God gifts you with the gift that he knows will best be used by you. With your temperament, with your abilities, this gift merges and you begin to extend the service of grace. The gifts are not born with you at physical birth, but come generously from God's hand. In fact, the New Testament writers could not conceive of a born-again believer without spiritual gifts. It just wasn't in their repertoire. A believer is given that urge to serve. It is the nature of the life of Christ in us to serve. As my friend's wife said to him, we were raised this way. Get up and get out. Well, she's saying, it's our nature to be busy. James 2, 14 through 17 says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Nothing worse than a dead faith. Now, you can be just as uh, 
uh, spiritually correct as you want to be about scriptures and, and, and religious rhetoric, but unless you're involved in the grace of service, what James says is that faith is absolutely dead. There's no sense of life there. There's no living hope there. There's no reassurance that if you were to pass from this life today, you'd go into the presence of God because that faith, he says, is dead. It's just laying around. It's, it's not alive. So we understand that when we look at the Scriptures here in the book of 1 Peter, the grace of service comes with that born-again experience. Peter also says that the grace of service operates through spiritual gifts. Beyond the new birth, God gives us to be useful and active. 1 Peter 4.10, each one of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others. Whatever gift. We talk about people having charisma. There's an attraction to that person if they have charisma. Well, that's the Greek word used here, gift. Whatever charisma you have, whatever gift you have, there's something so attractive about a Christian who is serving the grace of God to others. Something so attractive. There is a charisma there. And there's something so unattractive about a dead, beat believer who wants nothing more than to tell you how to run your life. And when you see him, you want to go in the opposite direction. But you see the one with charisma coming toward you. That's something they've received from God. And, and they come toward you, and they're attractive to you because they're coming to give graciously. Peter provides these examples in this passage of Scripture. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very word of God, the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides. Say, God's called you to teach. God's called you to share your mercy with others. God's called you to, uh, with the gift of helps. He also will strengthen you to do that. Say, I don't feel like doing it. Well, okay. Ask him to do it through you. Let him do it with that strength. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3.10, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one of you should build with care. Paul's charisma was the gospel. He was unattractive in his physical features. He says so. Uh, he was not a very nice-looking person. Uh, some people were repelled by that, but they were drawn to the preaching of the gospel. And that was his gift. When he went out, he preached the gospel. He was very persuasive with that gift. I'm laying a foundation, he says. Others would build on that foundation of faith. A young man recounted last week how one of the ladies who took care of him as a child taught him about the gift of mercy. He said she told him the story about a man on a train who realized that he had dropped his glove on a snowy train platform. And as the train left the station, he opened the window and dropped the other glove so that someone could have a pair. That's a gift. That's a gift that comes from God when one thinks that way and one when one acts that way, when one is not complaining, oh, my goodness, I dropped a good glove and I'm ruined. I can't use this one. I'll just throw it in the trash. Instead of that, drops the other glove out and says, someone can use a pair of gloves. That's giftedness. That doesn't spring from human nature. That comes from God's grace, the heart of God being gracious to the people around you. The grace of service is directed toward others. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, to serve others. And he uses an interesting word here. It's the same word we use for deacon. It's a person who waits on tables. It's one who uh, uh, puts a, an apron around their waist and they wait on other people. They, no service is too much. And that's what Peter's talking about here. Exemplified in the life of Jesus. John 13, 15 through 17. Jesus said to his disciples, I've set you an example. That's the only place you'll find that phrase in all the New Testament. That's the only place you'll find it from Jesus. The only example he ever set. Now, you would think 
That prayer would have been those, one of those examples, and it was, but he didn't say, I've set you this example to pray. Now, giving might have been an example, but he didn't say, I've set you this example. This is what he said. I've set you an example that you should do what I've done for you. What had he done? He had washed Peter's feet, the Last Supper. He says, very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. The blessing comes from the doing, not the thinking, not the writing, not the explaining, but from the doing. Jesus washed Peter's feet. Peter said, you're not going to do that to me. And Jesus said, if I don't, you don't have any part in my kingdom. You'll have to understand what servanthood's all about. And Jesus washed his feet. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 27 and 28. The proverbist wrote, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow and I'll give it to you when you already have it with you the grace of God is not constantly putting people off not constantly saying I'll wait till a more convenient time and then I'll help the writer says if you have it in your possession today use it today don't wait until another day in George Valiant's book aging well the 50-year Harvard study on aging and by the way, Valiant's still alive, and, and he has written another book, and, and it's now 75 years since these researchers started following these graduates, these college graduates, to see how they aged. But the book, Aging Well, the 50-year Harvard study on aging, a 76-year-old man wrote these words. He had been followed since he was a college graduate. The researchers said, we want you every five years to answer a questionnaire We want you every five years to have an interview. We want you every five years to have a physical because we want to know how you age going forward. So here's a man who's been followed since he was 20 years or so old, 76 years old. He says, I've been greatly blessed. I had an incredible, incredibly happy childhood, school years, college years, and career. Sure, my father was an alcoholic, but I loved him and stuck with him and helped him get into AA. But I am most proud of those times I helped others. Giving. When these researchers tried to identify a number of characteristics that help people age well, there were two primary ones, and one was giving. The other was forgiving, but giving. Doing something for someone else. Having a reason to get up in the morning. And so Jesus says, I'm not just going to give you an assurance that you're going to be in heaven with me one day. I'm going to give you a gift to stay busy till you get there. I'm going to gift you with something you can do. Valiant says sometimes it's, uh, it's hard to, to continue with that uh, gift. There's one lady, 70 years of age, Anna Love, to ask about her most important current activity. And I loved her reply because you've probably seen Anna Love driving around Sweetwater. Now listen to this story. 70 plus years of age, through my church, sharing myself with others and helping others, she says, is my most important current activity. Her bright yellow Volkswagen Rabbit stood poised outside her apartment door for errands of mercy. Even though she was growing blind, she was only one of her early friends who could still drive. You've seen her around the neighborhood, haven't you? And she loved playing chauffeur. This evening, she was going to take supper to a neighbor. If I don't do something every day to help someone, then I feel badly at night, says Anna Love. Isn't that wonderful? God has gifted us with the gift of grace to be used faithfully to take care of the needs of others. Christians cannot control how God has gifted them, but we can and do control if and how the gift is used. Our greatest ability is our availability, not withholding that which God has given us to be used this day. I want to challenge you this week a number of things. 
Uh, first of all, ask yourself, what is my purpose for getting up every day? Is it simply that I have a job and I have to make a living and pay bills? Not enough as a Christian. Second, what spiritual gift did God give me? And I've given you some scriptures here that you can look at a number, uh, four different places where you can see spiritual gifts and say, what is it that God's gifted me to do? And third, how have I used the spiritual gift God gave me in the last month? Have I helped somebody? Have I taught somebody? Uh, have I given a word of wisdom? What is it? And fourth, what benefit was my spiritual gift to someone else? How did that help someone else? Every one of us should have a reason for getting up in the morning. And God has given it to us by gifting us with spiritual gifts.